I'll let you know when we're live. Thank you. You're live, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Michel. Good afternoon, Council and uh, ladies and gentlemen of the gallery. I'd like to call this committee of the whole meeting for June 15th, 2023, to order with adoption of the agenda. So, want to make that motion for me, please? Councilor Devlin, seconded by Councilor Cherry. All in favor? Motions carried. Uh, adoption of the minutes of the Committee of the Whole of May 11th. Someone make a motion for me, please. Councillor Devlin, seconded by Councillor Lusso. Uh, all in favor? Motions carried. Any business arising from those minutes? Seeing none, I'm going to go right into delegations and presentations. Today we have Tourism Revelstoke here, Megan Tabor and Robin Goldsmith. So, uh, ladies, if you'd like to... Uh, Come forward, oh, I'm Carol Pellegrino. Yeah. Thank you. It's guest special guest speaker. That's it. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Seltz and Councillors. Um, as some of you might know, I'm Carol Palladino. I'm a director and the current secretary on the board of Tourism Revelstoke, and I'm wearing the community arts and culture hat. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to review the journey we've been on together over the past few years so we can better understand the current landscape. And much of the work that we're going to outline has been in close consultation and collaboration with the city's economic development staff. So this first slide um, just sort of outlines a journey from a destination marketing organization to a destination management marketing organization. Uh, we uh, created the destination management framework in July of 2021. And as a result, the organization completed a governance and structural review in January of 2022. The strategic business plan for 2023 was completed in March of 2022 and included the goal of increasing the municipal and regional district tax, which is the MRDT for short, to 3%, as well as identifying the benefits of a more diversified board. The plan was passed at the Tourism Revelstoke AGM in 2022 in June, and we implemented the board diversification plan at that um, AGM. City Council approved the strategic business plan in July of 2022 and passed the bylaw to implement the 3% MRDT. In September, that bylaw was amended and expanded to collect the MRDT from the CSRD Area B um, and also approved the strategic plan. Um, the strategic plan, I should say, was submitted to Destination BC and it was approved. The extensive outreach and community engagement began for the destination management plan at that point. In January of 2023, Destination BC, the province, approved our strategic plan, renewed the MRDT application, and Destination Management Plan was presented to the Tourism Team and the Economic Development Committee. The MRDT increased tax collection um, began in May of 2023, and the Destination Management Plan was ready for broad circulation in the community. So the big changes that all of that represents is we diversified the board, um, which is one of the reasons I get to sit on it as a community member, as opposed to an accommodator. We also, um, the big change was um, increasing the tax and approve, having a five-year strategy approved. Also a new tourism position was created to signify our commitment to destination management and Robin Goldsmith moved into the role of destination and sustainability manager. For closer look at what that new governance structure or board is. Um, in the past, RAW was just traditional accommodators, and now we have non-traditional non accommodators, experienced providers who are people out of the community that are involved in sort of a lot of the animation that um, our visitors experience, and also um, the two reps um, from RMR. 
And so I'll just pass it over now. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Awesome. Um, well, I've met many of you before, but I'm Megan, and I'm the marketing and destination director for Tourism Revelstoke. Um, I'm just going to present a few slides on kind of our evolution from where we got to where we started in 2008 when the MRDT began getting collected to where we are today, and then I'll pass it over to Robin to go through the destination management plan. So this is just kind of more of a graphic depiction of what it means to move to three percent. Um, so what it looks like for us is we, we continue to do these existing DMO activities with the 2%. So nothing really changes there um, from the 2% that we were collecting before. But that additional percent is where kind of the big changes come into play. So we get 0.8% comes back to us, and that's going into our destination management initiatives, which Robin will speak to. And then as part of collecting the 3%, we're mandated to give 2, 0.2 of that back to the province for a large-scale events fund, which we are able to apply to. Um, so we're successful in receiving money from, for the natural selection tool with that particular fund this year. Um, and really what this means is an increased revenue for destination management and an increased revenue for affordable housing initiatives through that MRDT OAP. So in 2008, we were at the 2%. Um, and this is just kind of a graph that's going to keep getting a little bit bigger and bigger. Um, but quickly, so basically visitors come, they pay 2% to the hotel tax, it goes to the government, it comes back to the city. The city has designated the Rumsfeld Accommodation Association as the organization to implement um, the marketing strategy, and then in turn, we derive more visitors from that marketing strategy. The RMI also came into play in 2008, so that's the Resort Municipality Initiative. Uh, so that's funding that goes directly into city infrastructure and events, um, and that's uh, administered by this Community Economic Development Department. So that's more funding coming into our community. In 2018, we saw the integration of the OAP tax. Um, so what this looks like is when visitors are staying in a short-term rental, um, Airbnb and VRBO are collecting that 2% on our behalf, sending it to the province, who sends it back to the city, and you guys have been kind of keeping that as an affordable housing collection pot. And then finally, here we are in 2023, where we bring in the destination management plan and the 3%. Um, so now visitors are paying the 3% MRDT, uh, 0.2 of that's going to the province. We get that additional 0.8, which brings us to 2.8%. Um, money is still going, 2.8% is going to the OAP, 2% is going to the MRDT, and that additional percentage is going to the destination management initiatives, um, some of which Robin will speak to today. And this is just kind of a funny meme that depicts like our journey from day one to where we are. So uh, we first were collecting money from visitors who attract more visitors. Uh, and then with the RMI, we are collecting money from visitors who attract visitors and invest in that tourism infrastructure and events that locals can benefit from as well. Um, and then in 2018, we saw collecting money from visitors to attract visitors, invest in events and infrastructure and contribute to affordable housing. And then here we are today, collecting money from visitors, attracting those value line visitors, investing in tourism events and infrastructure, contributing to affordable housing. And now we also get to invest back into the community well-being. Um, so just to speak a little more specifically to the destination management plan, um, which was circulated probably about a month ago um, to management and council, I want to speak a little bit more to how that was developed and, and sort of some of the specifics in there. So in our industry, we're talking a lot about regeneration. We've kind of moved from the trendy term being sustainable tourism to being regenerative tourism, basically meaning um, that tourism should go beyond just being self-sustaining, but should actually give back to the places that it's drawing from. So not just extracting from communities, but actually uh, benefiting the people who live there. Um, so we started playing with this idea of regenerative tourism and, and kind of moving from sustainable tourism, um, even prior to the destination management plan and prior to the implementation of the 3% MRDT. Uh, so we started on some of our campaigns, um, like the Thanksgiving Back program, which you may be familiar with, where we actually um, pay for visitors' accommodations if they come and, and visit and participate in a volunteer project. Uh, we also do some community contribution campaigns. So um, our marketing team runs a social media campaign where they comment on people's pictures and, and encourage them to make donations to our nonprofits, and then we in turn donate as well. Um, we've also been running some Sustain the Stoke campaigns. So we have a video series that we put out with Greg Hill highlighting some of uh, our local nonprofits and their efforts uh, to support our lo local community. Uh, and we've really been emphasizing that kind of um, visitor education and sustainability information in our, uh, 
on our website, through our blog posts and through our social media stories um, and across all of our marketing efforts. Um, I don't know what happened to my community event support logo, but anyway. <laughs> So we've also been working on contributing a lot um, of our MRDT funding towards supporting community events. Um, so that goes towards things like Luna, but also smaller events like the um, the ReFest. We just we just saw if anyone had the opportunity to attend that. That's a little bit more uh, environmental sustainability focus. That uh, what we really like about that is it really brings value for residents, but it's also a value add for visitors. So there's some mutual benefit there. Um, so we've been emphasizing that visitor education and regenerative tourism piece since before we got into this sort of destination management arena. Um, we were doing quite well in this sphere, so this is where we get to uh, do a bit of a humble brag, but uh, not humble at all. Um, in 2022, we won the Destination Marketing um, Professional Excellence Award at the uh, province-wide conference. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, we've been invited uh, to present across the province, across the country, and, and even worldwide. So uh, Megan had an opportunity to present on our Takeout Revy campaign that we ran through COVID. Um, I've been presenting on some of those sustainability initiatives um, and talking about the podcast that we ran through the destination management process. So um, really bringing light to Revelstoke in, in uh, what I think is a really positive way. It's not just showing that it's an awesome place to visit, but that we're also an incredible community. Um, and so the, the campaigns that we've been running under that are Thanksgiving Back, Community Contributions, Sustain the Stoke, uh, the Mask Up Revy campaign that we ran that it's kind of hard to remember now, the mask days, but uh, um, all of those really generated a lot of um, positive attention. So with that in mind, we were really um, trying to formalize our, our movement towards that sphere of, of regenerative tourism. And um, with the support of economic development, applied for a grant to Pacifican and also uh, received some funding from the um, Economic Opportunity Fund um, to create a destination management plan. Um, and uh, one of our colleagues who we worked with on the plan put it well, saying, uh, this project is about uncovering the community's long-term vision in a way that inspires immediate action to make Revelstoke a better place for visitors and residents. So really formalizing the link between tourism and the community. Um, as part of the community outreach, uh, we created a podcast, the Think Revelstoke podcast, and had an opportunity uh, to interview Marsha Walden, who's the CEO of Destination Canada. Um, and she really emphasizes the connection to residents. And I thought this was a great quote. She says, this is an industry that has lots to contribute. And ultimately, it should be about enhancing the world of the people who live here. One of the most obvious missing pieces in the conversation about how tourism should grow is being the actual host of a community, the residents that live there and their stake in how this industry impacts their way of life and the community they live in. Oops. So with that in mind, we really um, commenced our destination management process with a robust community outreach. Uh, we wanted to encourage people to think with a stretch goal in mind. So we looked at a, at a 50 year lens on what uh, residents and our stakeholders could imagine our community to be like. So we asked people what a thriving Revelstoke would look like to them in 2073. Um, to elicit that vision, we created a new website. So we now have the Destination Revelstoke website, which is a little bit more resident and stakeholder facing as opposed to our C Revelstoke website. Uh, we continued to publish our tourism talks column uh, and promote that. Uh, we hosted a couple of film screenings um, and invited community members to uh, watch films that were pertinent to the issues we were discussing. Um, we created a podcast. Um, and really did a, a robust uh, outreach process with surveying as well. So we actually got 1,100 responses to our survey, um, which we're quite proud of. Uh, we didn't want to ignore the people who really inherit Revelstoke in 50 years. So uh, we had a school project with uh, some young students at um, Arrow Heights and uh, Begbie View Elementary. Um, so they created these Dear Me in 2073 postcards, which I think were lurking around cancel chambers for a while. A lot of kids want flying cars, um, so we'll see if we can deliver on that. Uh, overall, reflective of the sentiment that we heard through that survey, I think this will not come as a surprise to anyone here, but um, on the positive side, people said, I feel strongly positive about the quality of life in Revelstoke. It's an inherently special place to live and is bolstered by wonderfully friendly people. 
On the more negative side, uh, we heard people are leaving when affordability becomes an issue, when housing prices are skyrocketing and there's not an equal balance, people need to leave. Uh, so ultimately, we asked the community to. Oops, <laughs> I didn't know that one playing right away. Ultimately, we um, collated those sentiments reached out to a number of stakeholders, spoke to um, our board and worked with our colleagues to develop um, some long stretch goals and some actions to achieve those. So this is our video. We asked the community to imagine Revelstoke in 50 years. To imagine the future, we want to leave our kids and grandkids. To imagine how we can make tourism work for us, not the other way around. And you delivered. More than a thousand Revelstoke residents shared their hopes, struggles, and dreams. The mountains are for everybody, so we just need to make sure that we create opportunities that allow everybody to come and experience this beautiful place. Because it's such a desirable place to live, the cost of housing goes up, and then it's harder for people, regular people, to live in this incredible town, and that's definitely one of the biggest issues that I see. Mountain towns and snow sports have been historically very exclusive. Being able to bolster inclusivity within those communities is really, really important. I think town needs to adapt and grow around our arts and culture, which is really thriving and flourishing right now. There's lots of people here for lots of different reasons. We really have to embrace all of that diversity in the people, and I think that's what will save us in the future. Anybody who wants to live here has an opportunity to live here in a safe and healthy way and making sure that the people who need the most support get what they need first and then the community will thrive from there. You can't build a municipality around people who can afford the real estate. We're actually trying to seek a solution to this thing that is going to see this place long into the future. That, that I think is really promising. What I've heard from visitors is, I want to give back, I want to contribute. And, and so what our job is, is to show them how. This is our vision, and we can make it happen. Our journey to a thriving community future begins here. It begins now. That's our public outreach piece that we released um, just a few weeks ago now, just about a month ago, I suppose. Um, so what we've created with the destination management plan, the idea is that this is a living document. Um, we don't want to create um, something that doesn't respond to our adapting and changing community. Um, so what we've done is, is created an overarching goal, which really is, is heavily borrowed from the goal, uh, central goals in the OCP. Um, and so the overarching vision is that Revelstoke is a sustainable mountain community that balances environmental, economic, social, and cultural values within a local, regional, and global context. We are a world-class destination while being an authentic and vibrant community for our residents. So really looking at moving from beyond um, thinking of tourism as just about visitors uh, and understanding that residents are, are really hosting the visitors who come to, um, who come to Revelstoke. So under the destination management plan, we identify kind of four key themes, and these are um, where we've created these long range 50 year goals and then action items under each of these. Uh, so we've got thriving people, um, community members of all abilities, backgrounds and identities are welcomed and have their needs met. Pristine environment, tourism protects and regenerates the local environment and its participants take climate action for the benefit of generations to come. Vibrant culture, our artists and cultural practices thrive in Revelstoke which makes a rich environment for diversity, creativity, community connection, and satisfying visits. And underlying all of that, equitable economy. So tourism takes responsibility for its holistic impact, including the positive and negative externalities resulting from visitation. The sector pays its way, addresses economic leakage, and operates within its carrying capacity. Uh, so some of the example actions we created under the destination management plan are uh, we looked at a visitor pay parking uh, project and potentially doing an RV uh, pilot project. So this is just an example, um, and it was something that was flagged by management, so something we'd love to collaborate on. Um, but if we look at an estimated cost of $4,000 to erect some signs and start um, enforcing that on our end, uh, potential revenue $25,000 a year at a low estimate, um, which could bring in some more 
revenue to further benefit the community. One of the actions we had identified as well as a second homeowner foundation. We heard from a lot of people, um, people who are full-time residents in the community who say they feel like these people are a burden and they're only here part of the time. But then speaking to some of those people, they said, we really want to contribute. Um, you know, we're just not, we're not sure how to do that. Um, and so, you know, hosting events and, and giving an opportunity for those folks to contribute, I think could be a great opportunity. Uh, we've also identified the option or the opportunity to um, do some surveying on our end and look at um, some of the housing needs and, and vacant rooms and what um, what opportunities there exist to sort of expand our housing stock because we recognize like that is a a problem that our industry is absolutely contributing to and something we can we can help support uh, and build capacity to help solve that. So basically, the idea here is that we can work together to add capacity for the city uh, to create not only data to help guide some of the decisions, but also revenue through some of the uh, actions in this plan to help um, benefit all of our mutual goals. I think the thing we're really proud of in this destination management plan is that we're really putting residents at the center of our stakeholder group. So basically the idea here is that we're making tourism a net benefit to our community. So this is gonna cost residents nothing. It's not a property tax burden. Um, we're not asking uh, for money or, or additional capacity from the city. It's going to cost, we estimate um, that we'll, our revenue from visitors will be a, roughly $500,000 through that additional MRDT, uh, and that we'll end up with priceless benefits to residents. A little cheesy for you there at the end. Uh, but that's what the, that's what the project is about, um, and I hope, I know I, I've had some comments uh, on the plan, and I definitely welcome comments, feedback, um, you know, it's an evolving and, and growing plan, but really what it underscores is that we want to ensure the externalities of our industry are addressed and work with our community. Great. And that's it. Thank you, Lise. Uh, any comments or questions from council? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your presentation and all the work that you're doing for the community. All right, uh, we are going to move on to 9A staff reports, manufactured home park redevelopment, residential tenant protection and strata conversion policy. Just a short title, Mr. Simon. Thank you, Your Worship. Let me put this in here and get the presentation up on the screen for you. I heard that there were some complaints on Tuesday that I wasn't actually in here because you guys love having my presence in here. So I really wanted to make sure that I came in here on Thursday for the presentation. <laughs> uh, thank you, Your Worship. So staff do have a brief presentation, if that's okay with council, to go through this policy that addresses a few different elements from our master plans and is something that has been requested by council. So what we were talking about today, kind of the short form version, tenant protection policy. A lot of stuff crammed into this one policy, but the whole theme of it is all about protecting existing tenants that are at risk of being displaced with future redevelopment. So we'll go over a little bit of background on the topic at hand today, go over some provisions from the draft policy, and then conclude with discussion with Committee of the Whole, where we are requesting some feedback from you guys today to determine the appropriate avenue to proceed forward with this policy. So starting off, we have developed a policy for tenant protection as guided from our official community plan, section 4.2 with respect to housing, as well as our housing action plan. Both of these master plans were adopted in July and August of last year, and they really do guide everything that's coming out of the planning department right now. So the policy is broken up into four parts. First one, and most substantial within the policy, is redevelopment of existing manufactured home parks, which are our mobile home parks within the city. Second one is when we're looking at rezoning of existing properties that contain a residential rental building with five or more dwelling units. So we wanna make sure that we're covering off protections for tenants that are in those buildings. Then the last two have to do with existing buildings that are rental buildings that an owner is applying to stratify so that each unit within the building would have its own title and then could, could be sold independently rather than having one building on one title with multiple units that's being rented. So this, uh, you can see how this all kind of comes up with that theme of tenants that are at risk of being displaced within the community. 
So starting off with a little bit of background, we'll start off on the manufactured home parks because this is certainly the bulk of the policy. Just to give you guys an idea of the feel of the context of the community right now, we have 19 manufactured home parks. One of those being the Johnson Heights Mobile Home Park is stratified. All the other ones are on one parcel of land where tenants have their mobile home that they may own and they are doing pad rent from an owner of the property. So when we look at if all these manufactured home parks are fully built out, we have a total of 494 manufactured homes within the city. That is a lot of manufactured homes. It equates to just under 15% of our total dwelling unit stock within the city. So this is a big thing, and we do really need to place a high importance on it because there is significant risk to tenants being displaced with redevelopment. So when redeveloping a manufactured home park, the owners need to secure all of their necessary permits and approvals from the city prior to them sending any notices to end tenancy with the existing tenants. In addition, owners must pay $20,000 to anyone that owns a manufactured home to help with the cost of relocating the manufactured home. If the manufactured home is not in a state to be replaced or to be moved, then an owner can apply to the residential tenancy branch for additional compensation beyond $20,000 that would account for the market value of that mobile home. So the policy when it comes to manufactured home park redevelopment, the whole philosophy and intent behind it is to support the long-term thoughtful transition of these manufactured home parks. Now, and I'll go over this a little bit uh, in more detail again, but very important for council to understand that the way this policy has been crafted is very intentional with an opportunity cost to see higher density development. We are knowingly saying we want to look at protecting the existing rights and uh, abilities of the tenants that are at risk of being displaced over just blanket redevelopment that would result in higher density development. So very important to keep that in mind as we're going through this. So an owner would typically require rezoning as well as issuance of a development permit. We only have two existing manufactured home parks left in the city that are zoned for use other than manufactured home park. So what council will be seeing when we are seeing redevelopment of manufactured home parks in the future is concurrent applications most likely for rezoning to change what's allowed on the land and then development permit to guide that redevelopment and what it's gonna look like, what buildings are gonna be proposed to be constructed on there. The draft policy is really focused on a couple things. The first one being early notification to existing tenants. So this is something that we've had come up several times now and we haven't had policy to guide it. So this is very, very important that before an application even comes in the door to city staff for us to review, notification to the tenants that the owner is planning on redeveloping needs to happen. That needs to happen at least two weeks in advance of the application being submitted to us. And the policy includes several criteria that need to be addressed with that early notification. In conjunction with that, the owner also needs to prepare what's called a tenant relocation plan. So if they are proposing to redevelop in a way that would displace some of the residents, then they need to come up with a plan on where those residents are going to go, what their options are, and importantly, what their housing needs are. The other thing that the policy really does try to guide as part of a rezoning application is what is the city willing to support? This is really, really critical. When we have developers come to the table, one of the first things they ask the city is, what do you want to see done with the land? And if we don't have appropriate policy to point them to, then it becomes a really challenging conversation and the uncertainty for a developer certainly goes up because they're unsure of what council may or may not support if our overarching plans and policies don't delineate what the city may support with redevelopment. So the policy has been set up again very strategically with a hierarchy of options for redevelopment of manufactured home parks. That first option, that would be the first preference, would be to stratify the mobile home park so that it is similar to what you see out in Johnson Heights. And it would be stratifying the park with the intent for the existing tenants that are doing pad rental to be able to purchase the land that their unit is sitting upon. This gets them into the market and it also minimizes their risk of being displaced because they would own their unit and they would own the land beneath their unit. Total fee simple lot that they are owning. Now with that, they would still have to rezone because under the current zoning in the bylaw, you're not allowed to stratify a mobile home park. You would need to rezone. We have two zones within the bylaw one that applies to just about every single manufactured home park in the city, and then another one that only applies to Johnson Heights. So you can think of it as the existing manufactured home parks would rezone to a zone that's comparable as Johnson Heights. And from a planning perspective, the benefit of this is it really is that long-term transition because that new zone, not only would it allow for their manufactured homes to remain, it would also allow for other uses, traditional single family dwellings, duplexes, and maybe even triplexes. 
So it might take 50 years for that manufactured home park to no longer have any manufactured homes because once they get too old, someone wants to pull it off. Well, the zoning allows me to build a duplex now. Maybe I do that. So it would really be this long-term thoughtful transition. And when you go out in Johnson Heights right now, it's actually a really good example because they are allowed to do duplexes and triplex or duplexes and single family dwellings out there. You see it mixed and intermingled with the mobile homes out there. And it does really make for quite a, an interesting makeup and an interesting development for them. Now, the second option, if that's not feasible, because we do need to appreciate that some of these manufactured home parks, the current state that they're in, as well as the current configuration of the lots on there and the roadways, it might be really challenging to stratify. So the second option would be for an owner to pursue rezoning that allows for residential rental tenure zoning. So what that means is you cannot stratify under that zoning. Everything you build in there has to be for rental. Nothing else. BC is very unique under the legislation that it gives cities the opportunity to implement residential rental tenure only zoning. You've probably heard me say it several times over and over now, zoning can't regulate user. This is one of those exceptions provided for within the legislation that we actually can. The third option would be when both of those first two are no longer feasible for whatever reason that a developer may have, because again, we wanna have some flexibility within the policy for council to apply some discretion. If those two options aren't feasible in a way that's deemed appropriate by council, then we would wanna go this traditional route where 25% of the units need, need to be provided as affordable housing units. And we have definitions in there for what the, the rental rates would need to be. And generally speaking, it would be 30% of the BC housing household income limit levels that are established by CMHC every year. So it really does, and, and really to break that down, a three or four bedroom unit would be going for about 1400 bucks a month under those rates. So it would be more genuinely affordable rental. And if an owner said, I don't wanna do that, then they would have an option to pay cash in lieu. That cash in lieu rate is set at $20,000 per unit, and it would be based upon the maximum number of manufactured homes that the park permits. And it's very important that that's in there. We have an appendix within the policy that outlines all 18 manufactured home parks. Remember, we have 19, but one of them's out in Johnson Heights and it's already stratified. So all 18 manufactured home parks and the maximum amount of units that they're allowed. If we don't do it based on that, and we say it's just based on however many units you have in the park right now, we're going to see some of them being pulled off in the middle of the night so that their cash and loot payments lower. So it's very important that it has to be based on the maximum number that they would be permitted to have. So that's it for the manufactured home piece. And the other pieces are certainly a little bit less complicated than that one. And there's they're a little bit more basic and they really do focus on early notification. So I'll give a quick rundown of them. So the policy also has provisions for when someone is rezoning an existing property that contains a rental building with five or more residential dwelling units. And the whole intent of this policy is to provide, again, early notifications two weeks in advance of submitting an application to the city to make sure that the existing tenants are aware of the redevelopment so that they can start making plans and they can work with the landlord. The landlord would also have to prepare a tenant relocation plan for this, very similar to the same way they would for manufactured home park redevelopment. And then the last ones have to do with converting an existing building that is not stratified to a strata. So anytime someone does this, it has to come to council for approval. This, even though it is something that is kind of subdivision related, the approving officer is not allowed to sign off on a strata plan for a previously occupied building until council has said okay on it. So all of these have to go to council. They do not go directly to the approving officer. So. We have policies right now for converting existing buildings into a strata. And what's recommended with this is not significant changes to those existing policies, but rather embedding them within this policy so that if someone's ever curious about what is the city doing to protect existing tenants that are at risk of displacement, it's all in one policy. It makes it easier for the residents, easier for staff, and easier for applicants so they don't have to sift through five or six different policies to understand what applies to them. So when we're looking at this, some of the things that need to be considered are applicable codes. Does the building meet current building and fire codes? Does it comply with current zoning regulations? And then for residential conversions in particular, council does need to consider overall vacancy rates within the city. Do we want to allow stratification of a rental building if our vacancy rate is, you know, some people here would say it's in the negatives, which I probably tend to agree might be a bit overhoused in some scenarios. Um, and then the overall needs of the community as well as options for right of first refusal. So again, this, these policies about strata conversion, they haven't been changed too, too much, but rather they're just embedded in this overarching tenant protection policy now. 
So engagement on this policy, we wanted to go over this quickly. So we did do substantial engagement, as you guys are aware, with the official community plan, the housing action plan. And I can tell you when we went out for public engagement with the final draft of the official community plan, the only change that we made at those last engagement events was with respect to mobile home park redevelopment. The policies and the actions were strengthened, were strengthened to ensure that the rights and protections for the existing tenants were front and center. So this was a big conversation at the OCP, and this did help influence and inform the work that we're doing now on the policy that you see before you today. It is intended to reflect the desires of the community through the engagement that was completed previously for those higher level plans. We did present it and receive support from the Advisory Planning Commission on May 16th. On May 17th, we also did present it to the Revelstoke Community Housing Society for discussion, and we did consult, uh, the policy was largely drafted in-house, but we did do obviously legal review on it. And then as well, we have a housing consultant that has supported us in the past. They did a, a once over of the policy to provide some feedback as well. So the two big things, and of course, anything else that committee would like to discuss today that staff are looking for direction on is any changes to the policy. Did we hit the mark with this? Or does council want us to go back and revisit certain things within the policy before formal consideration? And then secondly, is there any additional engagement that council would like to see before we bring this policy forward for formal consideration? And if so, who would you like us to engage? And in what capacity? Is it just informing? Is it asking for feedback that will actually result in changes? Or are we going to say, let's move forward with it as is, and let's make sure that we're informing people that these policies are now in place and that the intent of them is to protect existing residents. So that concludes my presentation. I will unplug now and hand the screen back to Mr. So and go sit down if there's any questions Great. that you guys have. Thank you, Mr. Simon. I appreciate that. Council, any questions of Mr. Simon regarding this uh, mobile home enhancement policy? Councilor Dublin. So I don't so much have a question. I just wanted to say that this, uh, this is well received. I like this. I like where you're going with this. I like that we're taking action on this. This is a thing that comes up quite often in our short time here so far, and uh, it's good to see that there's very clear actual progress in terms of a policy being made as opposed to just talk. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Dillon. Any other comments from Council? Councillor Orlando. Ah, uh, Your Worship, uh, thank you for the chair. Um, I have a number of questions. Some of them are uh overarching some of them are more detailed focused um uh so i'll start with just what's at the start of my list here which is a more detailed one um regarding um the option to redevelop and uh stratify an existing uh park um what is the mechanism for determining market rates if uh, uh the owner or the current lease holder opts to buy the property where their mobile home is located. I'm, I'm unclear as to how that would work. Uh, through your worship to Councilor Orlando, BC assessment is always a really good place to start with market rates. Market rates are something that certainly does fluctuate or you're gonna be on the high end or the low end, but that would be part of the rezoning proposal where the way the policy is crafted, we would be looking for the owner of the mobile home park to try and find attainable options for those existing tenants to feasibly be able to purchase because it defeats the whole intent if, you're gonna sell the land for $600,000 for a tenant to be able to purchase. We want it to be something that's realistic. So what we would encourage them is to look at local financing options as well, and try to establish the rates that are actually feasible for the tenants. But that would be part of the discussion as part of a rezoning. Follow up? I your worship, yeah. So if, um, uh, so that's, I'm, I'm just trying to understand where the, you know, the discretion for that would be like, you know, if I said, uh, 400,000 a lot, uh, that's my rate. Who is deciding that? Uh, is that up to, who is that up to, uh, to actually make a decision about what level that should be? But through your worship to Council Orlando, so the owner would need to come up with a plan and they would be determining and informing staff and council how they have come up with the rates and how many tenants are actually gonna you know, partake in it and be able to engage. But secondly, council is under no obligation if they are not satisfied that the application has addressed the needs of the existing tenants to approve the rezoning. So it really does give council a lot of ability to be able to ask these questions and make sure that the plan is actually being put forward in a way that meets the intent of the policy. And this being said as well, 
I do want to just indicate that this strategy to try and promote stratification is not something that we found in our review of any other policies throughout BC. So there will be some, some learning curves and some hurdles that we certainly have to work through when these applications come forward. Um, but we do think that this is the only way forward for existing tenants to be able to get to the market and to not be displaced at the whims of an owner. So certainly something that would need to be considered as part of the rezoning. I appreciate that uh, ability for council to weigh in and make some decisions on that. Do you have a follow up, Councillor Romano? Uh, you worship. I have uh, several questions, but I'm happy to take my. Any, any other uh, councillors with a question at this point? Councillor Russo? Uh, thank you, Mayor Schultz. Um, when we're talking about the redevelopment, um, <clears throat> option one is obviously for stratification. Um, is there a right of first refusal for the tenants that are in there, or is that just up to the discretion of the planning department? Uh, through your worship to Council Lucio, yes, there would be an option for a right of first refusal. Uh, under the Manufactured Home Park Tenancy Act, whenever there's redevelopment, there does have to, have to be an option for right of first refusal, and we do have it embedded in the policy. And again, the whole intent is, you know, you might not be able to not displace every single resident, but if you can maximize the amount that aren't being displaced, that is what this policy is really geared towards. Okay. Um, Go ahead. And when we're talking about stratification, if it is a mobile home park that has a mixture of people who do and don't want to stratify, is there a percentage that will stop the development or it does everybody in the mobile park have to jump into the stratification? Uh, through your worship, Councilor Lucia. Getting everyone to agree 100% when it comes to planning and development matters is very, very challenging as you guys have probably experienced in your time on council now. That said, there's no specific threshold, but the comments coming from the tenants and the ability for this to follow through, we don't want it to be a situation where stratification is proposed and only 2% of the tenants are able to take advantage of it and then the other 98% are displaced. So that's all part of the application evaluation and staff working with the proponents so that by the time we bring something forward to council for council to consider the rezoning, just keep in mind, stratification cannot occur without council signing off on a rezoning application. So council gets a lot of leeway when deciding whether or not to support a rezoning application and staff would be working with proponents so that we can provide accurate information to council on how many tenants are actually expected to purchase the land that their units are currently sitting upon. So that would all be information that would be available as part of the rezoning. Okay. And then when it comes to rezoning for stratification, would that come with the price of those lots or would that come after the rezoning of the property? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Lucio, staff would be aiming to have that information as part of the rezoning because we wouldn't be able to understand how many tenants are actually able to take advantage of it if those prices weren't worked out. The policy does make reference to trying to secure finance options, including alternative finance options. So sometimes locally there's alternative financing options for existing tenants to try and achieve what you want to achieve. And I will note too, there's also a lot of grants that are out there to support residents that are at risk, risk of displacement. So we're actually hoping that should this get through, it opens up the door a little bit for some creative solutions for existing tenants to be able to get into the market that are currently doing pad rentals in these parks. Thanks. Have on another follow um, Not on that. Oh, I can open the floor to somebody else. Anyone else? Councilor Chair. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, is it all right if I rapid fire a couple of questions before I yeah. have some comments? Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, through the chair, uh, do we have any checks and balances that uh, if right refusal is in there that's uh, on price other than market rate? Are we able to add those checks and balances? Through your worship, Councillor Cherry, may I just need a little bit of clarification on, on what the... So for it. option one, we talked about stratification with right of first refusal for current tenants. Uh, I just want to make sure that as it's coming across the room, a few people here, that we actually are able to implement checks and balances so that someone doesn't just price out the person that's trying to get who is entitled to right of first refusal. So through your worship, Councilor Chair, are you looking for if we could have something in the policy that would require all of the agreements to be solidified to the satisfaction of council prior to approving a rezoning with respect to tenants that are purchasing the land out from under them? Uh, yeah, something similar to that. Might, okay. might adjust that, though. 
uh, certainly through worship counselor cherry this is where we would get to the point that if there's any applicable conditions when we get to third reading of a rezoning bylaw that need to be addressed before council actually adopts the bylaw we could look at any legal agreements or mechanisms for confirmation that x y and z has been completed for the existing tenants to actually purchase their ability into it um, that could be challenging we'd have to kind of sort it out as we go through and consult with legal because you might not be able to purchase it until the stratification is actually complete and the lot lines are established and that wouldn't be occurring until after the rezoning stage so there would be this notion that the owners would have to have agreements in place with those existing tenants to the satisfaction of council but we'd have to look at what the specifics of those agreements actually entail because the lot lines would not be delineated legally speaking yet Okay, so there's a bit of a challenge there. Uh, next question under option two, we talked about you talked about uh, rental only uh, zoning. Uh, can we make sure that the checks and balances are in place so that it's long term rental only? Through your worship to Councillor Cherry, yes, through the zoning, it would only be permitted to be long term rental. Awesome. Next question Have you consulted any banks or lenders on this yet, as well as uh, park owners and tenants? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Cherry, we haven't consulted with any financial institutions. A lot of the tenants did come out through the OCP and housing action plan process. And then with respect to the existing owners, we haven't consulted with the owners because the intent of this policy is for tenant protection. And this isn't impacting the existing development rates of those owners. It only impacts them if they choose to rezone the property. And rezoning is not entitlement. It is something that needs council approval. They have to go through a process to get that. Okay. got another one for you <laughs> appreciate it uh appreciate it. let me answer all these questions ask all these questions uh what do we have in regards to some shallow and wide lots i can use an example that's in front of me uh if we look at if you know this offhand uh 111 or sorry 1113 4th street in 4th street east the willow Inn trailer park on one side of the park there's the uh the trailers are horizontal along the road uh, rather than being deep lots. Uh, do we have anything in our current zoning that would allow that to be stratified or in our potential upcoming zoning bylaw rewrite? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Cherry, the existing R5A zone, which is the zone that Johnson Heights is currently uh, designated as, it is quite flexible in terms of minimum lot width and minimum lot depth and minimum lot size. We will be revisiting those minimums either as part of our zoning bylaw rewrite or if we do get an application for stratification in advance of that we would be revisiting those minimums at that time essentially when we're getting a rezoning application right now in planning because we're going through the zoning bylaw update instead of bringing comprehensive development zones forward to council we want to fix the zones that we have and if they're good enough then we'll carry them forward into the new zoning bylaw when that comes forward for council consideration so we would be looking at revisiting those minimums certainly either with the, re the rewrite or with an application that comes in in advance of that awesome i appreciate that and then just a quick statement to council and everybody in the room uh part of this was made public at an apc meeting and since then, I've had numerous phone calls and messages, and emails uh, from park owners uh, that have actually received, have taken a look at this and for the most part have been, have received it well and seem very interested. So I just want to make that statement before anybody else asks any questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other questions around the table? I'll go back to Councillor Lando. Hi, uh, Your Worship. Thank you to the chair. Uh, my question focused on uh, the various contribution amounts that are listed in um, the report. Uh, for example, an amount uh, required for affordable housing or amount of payment uh, someone redeveloping their park would need to pay to the uh, owner of uh, or the leaseholder, etc. My question is, uh, why are those amounts set at where they are? Uh, the second part is, are there examples, existing examples of higher amounts where uh, other municipalities, for example, require uh, more, uh, be it a higher uh, fine, uh, dollar amount or a percentage amount? Uh, 
And uh, yeah, so I just want to explore the options for uh, uh, perhaps getting more um, uh, for uh, initiatives like affordable housing or more compensation for people uh, if they are displaced as a result of the redevelopment. Uh, through the mayor to Council Orlando. So there's two fees that are established. One of them is through the province. So we can't touch that one. That one is the $20,000 that needs to be provided to the existing tenants that are being displaced if they are moving out of the park. So that one is set by the province. Now, some policies, they go above and beyond, but they don't specify an amount. What we've experienced when we've reviewed other municipalities is they say an owner shall help with reasonable relocation costs. So it doesn't specify what those are. And the other amount that is within there is if someone goes with all the way down to the third option, 25% of the units as affordable housing units, or in lieu of doing that, paying $20,000 per existing manufactured home or the maximum amount of manufactured homes rather into our affordable housing reserve. If council wanted to set that rate higher, that's certainly something that could be examined. Staff said $20,000 as a starting point, we would be reevaluating this. We've done some preliminary uh, land economic analysis because we are looking at going down this road of there's certain developments right now that we might require housing agreements for in order to get extra uh, bonus density but the developments don't really make sense to have non-market housing within them so we are wanting to explore a policy that does allow for cash in lieu so this twenty thousand dollars figure figure is coming from that preliminary analysis that we've been completing where we're trying to sort out what housing agreements has the city entered into right now how much below market rent are they for 12 years? What does that look like? Working with the development community to say, you know, even if it's just anecdotally, what amount would you be willing to pay to not enter into a housing agreement? And we landed on $20,000 as a starting point for the mobile home park policy as an amenity contribution. That kind of is somewhere in the middle. And if we need to re-examine it, then we would certainly be interested in re-examining it in the future. Okay. Thank you. Follow up. Uh, uh, Your Worship, thank you. Um, yeah, just a statement. Um, I think uh, as part of, uh, you know, development of the policy and uh, getting towards a final policy that those questions need to be explored by Council and it would be great to hear uh, at one point Council's uh, opinions. I have a, another uh, sort of uh, uh, comment and I'm uh, happy to hear other questions from Council uh, before I get to it. but. It's my feeling that um, this uh, policy should be referred out to a number of uh, committees and organizations, including social development, economic development, uh, housing advocacy within, uh, for example, uh, groups like Community Connections, uh, Revelstoke Community Housing Society, Revelstoke Seniors Housing Society, uh, with, uh, since, uh, you know, a lot of these groups have uh, a lens of uh, are involved in the housing situation and have a lens where they can uh, provide feedback to Council on uh, uh, what is written and intended as a, pro a protection policy for existing residents. Uh, so that's just a comment. Um, I guess uh, another question I have uh, through the chair is, um, you know, I, I have a hard time picturing how it's going to actually happen, you know, so one model in my head is if someone applies for a stratification redevelopment over time some of them get built into duplexes some of them get in single family some of them don't change um and i'm wondering if there's any mechanisms for uh more thoughtful i don't know well, not thoughtful but uh more uh centrally planned redevelopment so for to give an example a quarter you know a park with a hundred you or 50 units uh, and somebody wants to put an apartment on you know 10 percent or 20 percent of that somehow is there a flexibility for them to do that for part of it uh and keep the remaining ones there and perhaps even move people around if you know because the concern is it's going to be uh i don't know what the analogy is but you know um broken between you know different lots so Mr. Simon. Uh, through your worship, Councillor Orlando, certainly. And one thing that's really important to note as well, this is a council policy. This is something that gives staff and an applicant direction. Now that said, if we have an applicant that wants to pursue something different that meanders on the sides of this policy, that's always something that council can consider and that staff would be able to bring forward for initial council consideration for feedback on as well. So the policy is intended to give some 
Think of it as the minimum guidelines for someone to follow when they're submitting a rezoning application to the city to understand what our preferences are and what our philosophy is with this type of redevelopment. It, not, it is not necessarily a one size fits all solution. And if something creative comes forward, you will certainly see staff trying to find a way to get behind it and bring it forward for council for initial consideration. I appreciate that comment. Follow up. Oh, your worship. Yeah, uh, another question and, and this uh, through the chair directed towards uh, staff is um, it's a fairly significant change, um, especially the allow allowance for potential stratification. My question is, uh, and I can't um, off the top of my head with just not having background in the, the market really understand uh, or predict what's going to happen as a result of a significant policy change. So one of my concerns would be um, it creates a gold rush where everybody says, oh my God, look at this, what we can do now, we just run to the bank with this, uh, and it creates a dramatic sudden change. So my question of staff is, you know, given uh, new allowances that are provided, do you anticipate this will be a significant, lead to significant movement on this? So uh, if we're trying to protect tenants, obviously we're trying to, you know, the, the intent of this being on the strategic plan was to get policies in place to protect tenants, existing tenants, uh, uh, residents of our community. Uh, I would be concerned that if we set up a policy that does have some, you know, that uh, ultimately doesn't protect them because it sets in motion uh, economic incentives that cause everyone to want to redevelop all of a sudden. And then I, all of a sudden I got to pay 400 grand for this lot in order to stay in my uh, leasehold place and wow that council really didn't do me much of a favor here did they so my question to staff is what do you think will happen if uh, the policies are proposed as they exist mr Simon, three words councillor orlando obviously we can't predict exactly how a market is going to react to a guiding policy that mm -hmm. council may or may not choose to approve mm -hmm. that said someone could apply for rezoning right now that would allow for stratification of mobile home park and if that application comes in staff don't have any real guidance or any detailed guidance to evaluate that application. So I would certainly paint the picture that as of right now, there are zero protections from the city side for the existing manufactured home park tenants, where we can't even say to an applicant when they come to submit an application to us, have you notified your tenants of your plans to redevelop? And the mm -hmm. response to us could be, well, where's the requirement for that? Mm -hmm. And we don't have anything to point to right now to say that as the requirement. So I would certainly, uh, from my in my professional opinion, the lack of a policy right now is what would be detrimental to the existing tenants. The policy is saying, if you want to rezone, which you're already allowed to do, to submit an application for consideration, here's how we want you to go through the process, adds additional protections for the tenants. Whether or not many manufactured home park owners take this up, that's, that's hard to say. And I will tell you that this will not be a really simple process for them as well. We have some manufactured home parks that have so 80, 90 manufactured homes in there. That will be an incredibly complicated process that will require a lot of consulting support and engagement on an owner side to go through a rezoning process to redevelop those manufactured home parks. So I really don't anticipate it. We've had one park owner who reached out a number of years ago who was interested in pursuing stratification. And they recently, even before this policy was presented to the APC, indicated that they would like to consider going through that process um, now at some point in the future. So I really would be surprised if we had any more than one over the next little bit, next couple of years, I should say. Should, uh, Councilor Stapenhurst. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just through the chair to uh, Mr. Simon, I'm currently looking at the BC Mobile Home Tenancy Act. Um, and in that act, I'm not really familiar with it, but it looks like um, there's already a year notice required for landlord's use of property. So how does this work in conjunction with that? Or, you know, maybe you can dive a little bit more into those details about how this was, you know, how this plan was made with, with that in, in mind. So through your worship, Councillor Stapener. So the policy is really clear that this does not replace anything in the Manufacturing Park Tenancy Act, the Residential Tenancy Act. It is intended to supplement those regulations that are already in place at the provincial level. So what that is referring to under the Manufactured Home Park Tenancy Act is when an owner is looking to actually issue that notice to end tenancy, they have to have all of their permits and approvals. So they come to the city, they get a rezoning, they get a development permit issued. And once those permits are issued, it is only at that point that they are allowed to issue that one year agreement to end your tenancy. 
uh, unless there's a mutual agreement and tenancy that an owner enters into with a tenant before that. But it gives that tenant then one year to find alternative living accommodations. This policy is intended to go the next step further and say, we don't want those tenants to be out in the first place. But if they're going to, then you have additional notification that you need to do even before you get all your permits and approvals. And here's what we expect of an owner going through the city process to get their permits and approvals. So you can think of this policy as a precursor to those requirements under the Main Central Park Tenancy Act ever even being applicable. Follow up, Council? Uh, no, thank you for that. Anything else from Council Council Russell? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Schultz. Uh, through the chair. Um, when you talk about the twenty thousand dollars that the province has decided for owners, um, does that apply to renters of mobile home parks, or is that just for owners? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Lucio, I believe it only applies to owners who have their mobile home that they're uh, renting a pad on, because it's intended to help them relocate that existing mobile home. If they're just renting out a mobile home, then they would be governed by the Residential Tenancy Act. Okay, um, and then when. We talk about people in these mobile homes. We're talking about people who are playing most likely below market rent. Um, is there any way for us to add additional payments if you have been there for X amount of years? The longer that you've been there, the more that you would be owed by the owner of the trailer park. Through your worship, Councillor Lucio, there's certainly, if Council wanted us to explore putting additional provisions in for compensation to tenants that are ultimately displaced, that's certainly something that we could look at. The one caution that I would have, and especially based on our experience with a couple applications, one that's currently in the works and then another one that was in Southside for redevelopment of a mobile home park, we have to make sure that whatever we're putting in there is within the administrative capacity of the city. So if there's comments saying, you know, if a tenant's been living there for X, Y, and Z amount of years, then they're entitled to this amount of compensation. What are the checks and balances for that? And how does the city actually verify that? You'll notice the policy as drafted is very deliberate that everything that the city is requiring is part of an application package. So it's part of once a developer comes to us and wants to submit an application, then we make sure that there's always checks and balances prior to council actually adopting a rezoning or issuing a development permit. Something like that would be after the fact when the all the permits and, and approvals have already been issued and they get their notice to end tenancy and they need to pay the $20,000 either on or before the effective date of the notice to end tenancy. And if there was additional requirements, then staff have to be following up with the owner, even after all the permits have been approved, making sure. So there is an administrative impact, certainly. And you'll notice a theme from the planning group whenever we bring something forward, really, really cognizant of that administrative capacity. We wanna make sure whatever we're gonna work with council, we can implement fully and that we're not gonna have any uh, anything that gets left behind as we start implementing. Okay. Um, could part of the process be a review of the tenants that they have and how long they've been holding leases and occupying that space? Uh, certainly through your worship. So one of the requirements when they're preparing their tenant relocation plan is they need to do a profile of all the existing tenants. And that would all be information that would be submitted with the application and then come to council. And if we ever get through a rezoning process, and council does not have enough information that they deem appropriate to make a decision, there's always the ability for council to request that information from staff or from the proponent. So it really does set those expectations and that is required in the policy. And if it's provided and it's not to the satisfaction of council, council just needs to indicate that to the owner. The owner goes back, provides additional information and we keep moving through the process. Uh, one last question. Um, when it comes to if we get down to option three and they are paying cash in lieu and the 25% of units are going into affordable housing, um, who would be overseeing the price on those as well as who is occupying those spaces? Through your worship, Councillor Lucio. So just want to clarify, it would be one or the other. So it's either 25% yep. of the units as affordable housing units, or they do a cash in lieu payment in lieu of entering into those housing agreements. So the housing agreement does need to come to council for adoption via bylaw. And the housing agreement itself would have the specific terms about who it's able to be rented to and what the specific rates are. So you'll notice we have three options in the policy for what the rental rates would be. It would either be 30% of a gross household income based on those BC household income levels that are set each year by CMHC, which are, they, they are quite low. Again, it's a 13, 1400 bucks for a three or four bedroom apartment, which very, very challenging to find for a new apartment in Revelstoke right now. It would either be that or a rent geared to income where we establish the income threshold that we want to target with these units and no more than 30% of your gross income can go towards rent. 
or lastly, and this is where it opens it up a little bit for council discretion, a rate deemed acceptable to city council. So there certainly is options and that would come back for bylaw consideration by council. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, Councilor Cherry? Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, just in relation to some of uh, Councilor Lucio's questions, uh, I wanna make sure that council is aware that $20,000 relocation uh, amount is forfeited if the trailer cannot be moved, if it's too old or if any garbage is left on that property, it is forfeited. And that's been an issue with a lot of people who have tried to access that fund. Uh, so I just wanna make sure everybody knows that. Uh, another item, uh, we have a couple of families in town that own multiple trailer parks. Uh, They're fielding almost daily phone calls from developers trying to purchase them uh, for redevelopment. Um, the only reason that some of them haven't done this is because they don't want to see their tenants go without, uh, be evicted, mass, or completely redeveloped. Uh, I do think there needs to be some more consultation, but uh, just from my phone, just from my discussions with them, they are very uh, supportive of what's being presented today. But I think that they should be listed as well as uh, who we should engage with further prior to council consideration. Okay, thank you for that comment. Any other comments or questions from council? Councilor Orlando. Uh, Your Worship, just a, a, a detailed um, uh, question uh, through the chair. If someone were to come forward tomorrow under our existing policies uh, with a plan to uh, stratify and redevelop that, uh, development application would require it to be uh, uh, developed according to not mobile home park side lot sizes and setbacks, but to, uh, you know, whatever uh, existing rules are. So it's my understanding is that if we advance this policy and allow for stratification, uh, the, the main difference would be you would be stratifying existing lot sizes uh, as opposed to a new development that would have uh, presumably bigger lots and requirements. Is that correct? Through your worship, Councillor Orlando, this is where it will be context specific to each manufactured home park because they are all very different. Some of them are very well delineated with pad areas and lots already identified, even though it is one legal parcel with appropriate road network that meets minimum basic standards for engineering. And some of them certainly aren't. And obviously as part of this policy, we didn't do a robust analysis on all 18 manufactured home parks within the city. That's certainly something that, uh, you know, you need a surveyor to go out there and actually look and see what is feasible. Now we would be open and this is where staff would be working with the proponent when they come in to make sure that any stratification proposal that comes in, because it would be a bare land strata, that it meets basic standards for access, meets basic standards for siting. We'd be working with have our, uh, our manager of building and bylaw here, we'd be working with the building department to make sure that there's no issues in terms of separation for mm -hmm. access and fire and other safety related issues. So there is a lot of staff evaluation. And I do wanna make clear too, like the way this policy is set up, stratification will not be an incredibly easy process to go through. But if the benefits of it are such that we don't displace the residents that would otherwise be displaced. That's really the question that we're at. If it takes a little bit to get there, in my professional opinion, then this is what makes sense because we're protecting the existing tenants and trying to afford them the opportunity to actually get into the market here, which is very, very challenging. To Further comment from council, council Lisa. Uh, thank you, commercials. Uh, through the chair, if we get to option three and people are um, relocated and a development is made, is there the option for those people that were on that property to have the option to buy first? Through the uh, through your work for Council Lucio, yeah, yes, there still would be right of first refusal for the tenants that are being displaced. Basically under the Manufactured Home Park Tenancy Act, there's always the right with the new units that are being constructed in the old Manufactured Home Park for those existing tenants to have a right of first refusal. Yep. Um, and that would really be the intent. If we ever get to option three, and they are doing the option where it's 25% of units on site as affordable rental or affordable home ownership. There would be a major push from staff to try and work with the existing tenants and set rates at a, at a, in a way that actually makes it attainable for those residents to activate on that right of first refusal. I can tell you in my experience, 
with new development right of first refusal comes in and you have $300 a month pad rent and then the new rental rates, even when they're below market, are still 26 or 2700 bucks for a one or two bedroom unit, that's not really going to be feasible for a lot of the tenants, right? So that'd be something we'd be working with them on to actually make it a reality. Yep. Thank you. For the comments, questions, Councilor Chair. Thanks, Your Worship. Just to ride the coattails of Councilor Lucio's questions again through the chair. Uh, in regards to option two, will that also, for the rental tenure only, uh, is there any checks and balances to ensure that current tenants will be, for, will get first dibs on those rentals? Through your worship, Councillor Cherry, again, there still would be the right of first refusal option. And as we delve into that option, you'll notice that the policy doesn't make a requirement if you're going under that zoning for there to be any percentage of the units to be at a certain amount of discounted rent. That's certainly something that could be explored. Um, now that said, you would be restricting the whole use of the site so that it's only rental buildings. So it's kind of this delicate balancing act as to whether or not that's feasible or desirable for a new developer coming in. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a second question. Uh, is there any difference between current strata roads and some of these older mobile home park roads? And um, by that, I mean width, uh, turnaround radius for fire, et cetera. Through your worship, Councilor Cherry. Uh, again, we haven't done a detailed analysis on every manufactured home park, but just from the ones that we have been to and even looking at them on our aerials, that will be a big part of the conversation with our engineering group. We're lucky we have an engineering team that is very reasonable for proponents to be working with. And under the bare land strata regulation, you don't have to have roads when you're stratifying that meet the minimum requirements for a public municipal roadway, but they do have to meet basic requirements for fire department access, as well as basic engineering best practices. So that is basically how a strata road is reviewed what state the existing roads are in and how that compares to what the city would accept as a strata road, it's impossible to say right now. That's going to require civil engineering analysis on site within these manufacturing home parks. Thanks. Uh, just the last question. Uh, is there anything you've heard at the table yet that you haven't already thought of? Um, through your worship to Councillor Cherry, excellent conversation and it's really good for staff to, to be hearing this. I think the key for us in the planning group is constant monitoring evaluation. And if we're trying something that hasn't been tried before and we haven't come across this in the province, and as we start going through the process, if there's challenges, you'll have staff that are being transparent and saying, here's some of the challenges, we need to tweak the policy, let's have a conversation about it with council. So I think that's really the key with these policies and the direction that we are trying to go to solve some of our housing issues. No one knows the exact solution or what answer is best right now, but the key is constant monitoring, evaluating, looking at the data. Is this working? Is it not working? And how can we make it better? Perfect. And I think this is actually my last question through the chair. Uh, if you were to go for uh, further engagement with the major uh, the parties that uh, Councillor Orlando listed, as well as lander, uh, sorry, park owners, say lenders, um, banks, as well as some tenants or as many tenants as possible. When do you think you could have this back to the committee the whole? So just clarification, Councillor, are you asking our staff to go to every mobile home owner and every mobile home tenant to get feedback? Uh, and so my question is more in regards to how long we'd have to wait on this prior uh, to get feedback from X amount of parties before we be able to look at this again. Good feedback. Uh, through your worship, Council Cherry, and just and to all of Council, really, certainly when we get down to the policy level, there's generally not substantial community engagement. The time that we do substantial community engagement is at our master plan level, official community plan, housing action plan, zoning bylaw. Now that doesn't mean that there's not merit and that there's not the ability to do additional engagement, but we would want to be really clear on who we're engaging and what the intent is. If the intent is to inform community members that this policy is being worked on and it is being brought forward and we want you to be aware, that's different than saying, we want to go out, we want to go to these stakeholders and we want feedback from you. And the expectation is that your feedback is actually going to help inform the policy 
Those are very different things. So when we worked on the official community plan, we got really far along the engagement spectrum to collaborate with the community where they actually influence the policies and the actions in the OCP. Are we looking at doing that for this policy? If so, that's going to take a lot longer than it would be just to inform the existing owners and tenants that this policy is being worked on. So staff would be looking for that direction from council and the impact of engagement of additional engagement could be as simple as one month delay to send out a letter to all the existing manufactured home park owners, or it could be as much as six months to a year. If we go out and we want to do substantial engagement, we get feedback that results in changes. You need to come back to the committee of the whole to discuss those changes, then go back to the public to discuss those changes. So it really depends on the scale and scope of the engagement that council would be looking at staff to undertake. Councilor Cherry, follow up. Thanks. I appreciate all that uh, all that info, Mr. Simon. Uh, I think my biggest issue here is that if we don't consult uh, lenders, then there might be an absolute failure of this. If if we're offering right of first refusal, if somebody owns their home, their trip, their uh, their mobile home the goal here is to have them be able to get a loan for the lot if that's something that lenders won't look at then i think this this may need to be completely rewritten or changed a lot of it changed uh so i i really want to ensure that i'm making that point clear that i i think they need to be consulted to make sure that this is something that they'll be even able to lend on when we're talking about stratification okay. Appreciate that comment. Uh, and so I'm going to go back to the statement that Mr. Simon has said. So a lot of our community has been engaged both through the OCP process and through the housing action plan when we talked about tenants' rights and tenants' uh, input. Going back to uh, the homeowners or debt, not the homeowners, the mobile home park owners, you're going to get one or two responses either there quite comfortable in looking after their tenants with this sort of policy, or they're not going to be happy. It's going to be one way or the other. So um, I'm not sure that that's of, uh, of value in my mind. Having said that, I am going to ask Mr. Simon, you had two questions on your proposal. Could you just go over them individually for us? And we're going to weigh in on those to give you some direction. So the first one, please. Through your worship. So the first question is, have we hit the nail on the head with this or are there any specific changes that you would like us to undertake or items to explore further with respect to the actual content of the policy? Okay. Comment from council regarding the content of the policy. Councilor Devlin. I personally, I mean, I'm not the expert on the real estate sort of things in this. So I do to a degree defer to Councilor Cherry's expertise on this, but from what I'm looking on a policy level, this looks like it covers the things we wanted to do when we were setting our goals for the policy. So, I mean, I, with little tweaks maybe for the people who know more about the real estate than I do, I feel like the policy itself is pretty much on the money. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Orlando. Uh, yeah, your worship. Um, uh, I guess, folks, I'm prepared to make a motion after uh, when we get to that point. Um, uh regarding questions uh specific questions of, uh, on the policy um it's going to stem my feedback is going to stem from that motion which is i think we need to refer this out uh to groups uh several groups as mentioned and i'm happy to list them all in a, a motion and uh and hear any additions uh with friendly amendments from council if they so choose to do so um so that is that is my uh my main focus and part of that will include um, uh, a request to um, hand deliver notices to every single mobile home park owner to that uh, we will have an open house that does summarize what we're doing as well as uh, feedback that we've received. Um, uh, just uh, word to the wise, uh, I think, <laughs> in my opinion, is, uh, you know, uh, our we live in a zero sum attention economy and and people a lot of people don't pay attention to the ocp or anything that the city does uh, but if you do make changes that uh down the road lead to significant impacts like putting them out of a house and home then uh, uh council 
can potentially face the wrath for the decisions we make. These kinds of decisions are complicated and, and I don't have a crystal ball as to what's going to happen through this. Uh, well, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, recommendations and this has nothing to do with current uh, planning staff, but we've seen uh, recommendations from uh, 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 planning staff that have backfired badly before, such as uh, uh, the uh, R1 zoning uh, for or whatever, or RV VR1, whatever, the vacation rental zoning that led to uh, some brutal scenes uh, here in the council chamber. So I'm concerned, not because I don't, I sense something wrong in the policy, but because of the unknowns of the implications of some of the policy and what the results will be. So that's why my, my favor is to refer to these groups, including uh, groups that are known to have a social lens on that focuses on uh, the people and how these policies can potentially impact them. I'd love to hear from them. Great, appreciate that. Councilor Stephen Hurst, any comments before I come back to this motion? Uh, none of the signs, thank you, Your Worship. Good, Councilor Palmer. Uh, thank you, Mayor Souls. I'll just make a few comments. Sure. Um, uh, in, interesting, uh, thank you very much, very interesting. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of complexity that um i find yeah find interesting i guess it's just saying it's uh um i'll just go go through some of them so on the on the policy level so as a policy as with all policy they're non-binding so whatever future councils do and that's probably one of the biggest risks uh, to this policy is that future councils or even this council when an application comes through and whatever however it's sold uh, will be on the merits of how that's sold before the council at the time so that's just a comment um i'll just rattle them off the the implications on the ocp i think i'm going to avoid that discussion but there's a complexity there um the the question that hasn't been raised here or the implications is the whole idea of tiny tiny home entities and what that looks like that's a whole nother conversation because essentially mobile some people would argue mobile home parks are essentially tiny home villages maybe not as uh, people might romantically envision what they might be like um the i find it legally from the legal perspective the policy industry interesting uh and so um it's good there you're having some legal review. Um, I, I wonder if it's going beyond city authority. It feels like it to me, there's certain input that it's getting into, uh, especially when we're trying to regulate areas that are not in sort of traditional local government, um, uh, you know, basically the pricing and the ability of what rights of uh, owners have. So. Um, administrative capacity, I think you've addressed it, that. And then ultimately, the whole idea about protection of uh, the residents there, um, the residential tenant protection, and is this affordability, I, I question, you know, how that's manipulated. Uh, and uh, these are people that are not in the market right now. So is, can this policy actually achieve the goals that are in here? So I'm not questioning the policy in itself. I'm just, uh, I find it interesting. I'm, I wonder if we're going to be doing a lot of work. If you've done a lot of work already, it's quite fascinating. Um, at the end of the day, whether it really makes any meaningful impact I, I i guess we'll find out as it uh, emerges so that's that's my comments great appreciate yeah. that councilor chair thanks your worship uh, i think i'm going to kind of jump on uh councilor orlando's uh side here with a friendly amendment uh, i want to make sure that lenders are able to lend on this uh if we go to stratified if you know a owner owns the unit uh i think manufacturer sorry park owners need to be consulted uh yeah i think uh i'll leave it at that i might i might jump back in at the end hey, when we get to a motion you can weigh in on that if you so desire thanks okay. councilor Lucille. 
Uh, thanks, Marshalls. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to agree with uh, Councillor Orlando as well. I think because there isn't a policy that we can find that we're kind of modeling this after that we do need to engage with the community as much as we can and getting lenses from different organizations will kind of help us get a more holistic view of what people are dealing with. So I'm in favor of all the work that's gone into this policy, but I do think that there needs to be uh, some more engagement with the community. All right, so now I'm going to come back to Councilor Orlando. You want to put a motion on the table? Uh, let's be concise in the motion. So if we need to get you to read it a couple of times, we will. Uh, Ms. Russo, you're prepared uh, as we go forward here to uh, write this motion? Yes, Your Worship. Right. Councilor Orlando. Um, sure. Uh, before I do so, uh, through the Chair, Your Worship, um, I, I'm happy with uh, also seeking uh, input from lenders, but I don't know how to word that into uh, res to include that in the resolution. So I'm wondering if anyone has any suggestions on that. I think you nailed it. The word lenders, uh, unless Councillor Cherry, you have with someone who's going to be able to give a mortgage on that sort of uh, entity. Third party financiers. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so uh, your worship, thank you, uh, and Councillor Sherry, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm um, uh, making the motion, and the motion is that staff refer the proposed policy uh, to uh, the Social Development Committee, the Revelstoke Community Housing Society, the Economic Development Commission, uh, the Revelstoke Women's Shelter Society, uh, Community Connections, Revelstoke Society, uh, in care of the people who do housing there, uh, and uh, that staff uh, create uh, an online um, feedback portal through Talk Revelstoke. Uh, and schedule uh, a public open house, including uh, delivering uh, notifications to each uh, mobile home uh, resident res residential address and uh, mobile home park owner. Um, um, and that the open house happen after we get initial feedback from the uh, other groups uh, consulted. All right. That's it. Seconder for that motion. Councilor Stapenhurst. Any further discussion on the motion? Councilor Lusan, if you want to make a comment, then Councilor Cherry, then I'll go back. I'll, I'll go back to Councilor Orlando first. Do uh, you want to speak to this or you want to add something to it? I want to add something to it. Okay. I left out uh, third party renders. <laughs> I think yes. Mr. So and Ms. Floyd have got that. Okay. Now. Thank you. All right. Uh, now I'm going to go back, Councillor Lusso. That was my comment. Okay, yeah. got it. <laughs> Councillor Cherry. That was also my comment. Uh, I just have a question about uh, the timing of the info session. Uh, do you want it? Are you looking to have it after feedback has come in? We haven't. I mean, we can request feedback. We can't demand it. So. I, um, you worship my idea is to uh, refer to all these groups, give them a deadline, and then schedule the meeting afterwards because I think it's important context for the uh, mobile park uh, or, or um, the park, the residents to see also other opinions from these groups. Like, so if the community housing society says this, or the uh, community connection people said that, it would be good to have their summary so people can have a context. Uh, so that when we go to an open house, those who are tenants in that facility or in those mobile home parks can come out and see what others have said and yeah. bring in at that point. Okay, yeah. so we've got that. Do you have comment, Mr. Simon? Uh, three worship, if I may, just a question of clarity so I understand the resolution. The expectation is for staff to go out and hand deliver notices to all 494 at mobile home park tenants that would be uh, existing right now and then send a referral out to several agencies uh, or several committees rather request feedback on the policy provide a summary report of that feedback that's been received and then after all that has been received schedule an open house and i should say prior to all that put a talk rebel stoke tile on and then after we received all the feedback prepare a summary report and then prepare an open house and then once that's been completed 
bring that back for subsequent committee of the whole consideration so that council can understand feedback. Yep, long drawn out process by the community. So through your worship, just so that council understands, my expectation would be bare minimum, you know, three months at least, and that's if this is a priority. And I will, I do want to know if this will impact other projects that staff are currently working on, predominantly being the zoning bylaw, because I will certainly need capacity. And again, this project wasn't budgeted for until 2024. So staff are working off of a, a very, very slim budget for this. And so I will certainly need the capacity of the entire planning department to uh, accomplish what has been requested. Yeah, that's important for us to know. You have a comment, Councillor Ryan? I, I, I was I missed it, but um, the intent was only for one open house. I don't know if you mentioned two open no, houses. Just, just, just one. Yeah. Councillor Palmer, do you have a comment? Yeah, um, I'm debating with myself whether I'm going to support the motion. Um, so this. What this motion proposes, it would go to council, of course, for ratification if it passes here, is a fairly major rezoning or OCP kind of exercise where there's actually binding bylaws that are in place. And this is for a policy that is non binding. And so I'm trying to imagine in the future someone that. A, 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 mobile home park develop somebody has, that's bought that and has some other plans and they're going to sell it on whatever merits they have. The policy will be here, but there'll be the salesmanship of the development or the flavor of the day of what's happening. And uh, so we'll go through a lot of work that is actually not binding. And so, uh, and not just work with by staff, but also community, the, the engagement with the community. So those would be my concerns. If we were talking about a, a bylaw change, I think that would be different. Um, so that I, I think that expresses my concerns on that. I'm not sure how I will vote at this point. I'm concerned as well. I, I'm hearing what you're saying and, and hearing the timeline, the amount of time and money that it's going to go into this and then it not be necessarily binding down the road. So, Mr. Simon, I'm going to come back to you because you brought this forward with the idea of protection of our tenants in our community. Because one that was one of the things that we brought up at the OCP was how do we protect these people? And it, it was a priority of council to protect these people. And so when I look at that and I look at the policy that you presented as I'm satisfied with what you've presented us because I think you've done the groundwork to uh, protect those people. And so I'm I'm prepared to, I'm satisfied with what you presented. I'm not uh, disqualifying what members of council have said, but I'm, I'm concerned about the timeline, the zoning, that sort of thing. You've, you've made defined where we were going this term with our zoning bylaw and what we've done. And so I'm, I too am concerned about putting extra work on uh, staff to get to where we already are. And I don't mean to disqualify what our counselors are saying about the engagement process, but I'm hearing that I've heard from residents in the community that we've already engaged in their concerns and and that's why you've brought this policy forward so i'm not sure that going through this exercise is going to get us any further down the road um, to the end result however we're going to go through if, if it's passed we're going to go through this policy now we're putting the zoning bylaw in advance for that three-month period which is a concern of mine um, so I just want to hear from uh, some of council before we vote on this as to um, where you feel where you feel we're going as far as now you've heard that zoning is going to be. Is it applicable to put the zoning on hold to get this done? How do you feel? So any comments from council? Councilor Devil. Ah, uh, I might be at the risk of repeating myself here, but due to the fact that this is a policy, as Councillor uh, Palmer has mentioned, due to the fact that this is meant to protect people in 
mobile homes, which I think we have talked about numerous times, even our, us before previous council, I'm assuming also talked about it, or this would not be in the works. Um, I don't, I don't see the benefit to jumping through that many hoops on what is essentially a policy. I mean, I might be vastly understating our elected position, but setting policy is kind of the whole thing that we were kind of voted in to do. There is, of course, a measure of public feedback, but this is something that we've heard from the public that they want. This is something that staff has heard specifics about what kind of things they're looking for. Lending companies not potentially lending to Strata, to me, is sort of a non-issue because currently people can apply to rezone to strata and they would have the exact same challenges except less protection so if the purpose of this policy is to protect people in that situation uh making sure that lenders will lend to allow them to buy strata is not really going to help or hinder in that situation as it's something that already they would need to worry about and lenders are going to do what lenders are going to do i would rather see more protections than less so I'm not going to be particularly in support of the motion to draw this out and put more uh, other more important things on the back burner that we've also been talking about for months. So I think this is probably pretty solid as far as I can tell. But again, that's just my opinion. Thank you. Any other comments from council before I call a question on the motion on the table? Council statements. I'll make the comment and I'm not 100% sure I'm, I'm in favor of um, of running this by lenders. I just think there's too many um, other factors that lenders look at when they're making decisions on, on whether or not to finance a particular purchase or project. Um, and then there's also your, your, your conventional lenders and then your non-conventional lenders. So I think there's, there's too many variables when we look at the lenders um, to, to really have them weigh in on a policy. I mean, I know uh, uh, Councilor Cherry can weigh in on this. I, I know they look at the age of the mobile homes they look at your financing. They look at your your credit score. So I, I, it, it could be too 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 vague of a question for 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 a lender to to give us concise, clear information. Um, so that you know, I may be more in favor of just approving this. You know, you know, passing the policy without all the all the feedback and, and loops. So okay. Any anyone else? Comes with yourself. Uh, thank you, Mayor Schultz. Um, I see the benefit of this. Um, we're talking about our baseline population. We're talking about people who are um, helping run our tourism. Um, it's, we need development, we need housing, but if we are putting development in front of our residents, that's gonna have ripple effects that affects the community for years to come. And as much as this might slow our zoning bylaw down for three months, I think the ripple effects could be felt for years if we don't take the time to actually do this and get the public engagement. So I think the, you know, and I'll, I'll go back to the comments where we heard from the public at dealing with the OCP and the housing action plan, where they did say we are concerned about our welfare in our mobile homes. And that's the reason this plan was developed. So we have heard from them stating that they are concerned about their welfare. We deal with that in this policy. So doing the engagement is just reaching out to the social sector, um, but if it's going to put things down, slow things down, then that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, but I appreciate that. Come on, go. Councilor Cherry had his hand up. Did you not, Councilor Cherry? I did. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, maybe I, I think I need to clarify the lender thing. Um, the reason, I don't know the answer to this, uh, which is one of, that kind of bothers me. If you own your mobile home, on a rented pad and they want to stratify the pad, will a lender lend you money for the pad when you already own the home? Uh, because if that is not something that's going to happen, then I think there's an outright failure of this policy, uh, which is why I think we need to bring somebody with that sort of knowledge to the table, whether it be RCU or somebody not local. Um, by the way, the conversation's going and the amount of time and effort this would all take. I'm curious if Councillor Lando may want to amend uh, what he has in front of us to drop it down to a public open house or info session, uh, some mail outs, and talk Revelstoke. Uh, and not refer to 
the organizations? Uh, I mean, that's that's basically an email, but they could also comment through Talk Revelstoke. Um, your worship, uh, I, I, I don't really think that part of the, in my view, that part of the uh, motion is odious. Uh, it would, you know, in my view, it would be simply be sending a letter, the same letter to those five or six organizations and saying, can you get back to us by six weeks from now uh, and uh, provide your feedback. Okay, thank you for that comment. So, any other comments on this, Council Palmer? You have your hand. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you to fellow councilors. So, I've decided I'll be voting in opposition to the uh, motion, um, specifically on the zoning and affordability and people that are needing that. The zoning bylaw is where the meat of real legislation, a real bylaw that can make a difference. And I think that really should be the emphasis of. Of we're going to be engaging a, a wide swath of the community that we should really be focusing so on those social housing issues. Where in the zoning bylaw can they have some meaningful uh, 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 implications on real bylaws that have teeth to it? Uh, so on that basis, I will be voting in opposition to this. Okay. So. Any further comments on the motion on the table before I call a question? And then, I, and then I'm just going to ask after the vote um, where we go from here, depending on what happens. So, Councilor Chair, do you have anything further to say? No, thanks, Your Worship. Okay. So the question is, we're voting on if you want our staff to go out and do the engagement as laid out in, uh, in the uh, uh, motion on the table. And uh, so that's what you're voting on. So I'll call a question. All those in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. Note that uh, Councillor Cherry, Councillor uh, Orlando, Councillor Lusau are in favor. Opposed, please raise your hand. So note that uh, Councillor Stapenhurst, Palmer, Devlin, and Mayor Sauls are opposed. This motion has been defeated. Now, the question I have, we have this before you. The, the simple question was, um, do you want this to come to council? We'll have further debate on council to see if there's uh, practicality to this policy as we go forward. Is that really where we're at? And so I'm going to go to Ms. Floyd, comment. Um, oh, so I'll, I'll go back. Uh, Council Palmer, you want to weigh in before I go to council? Uh, yeah, Mr. Summit. Um, so Mayor Souls, I, I think really it's in the in the, the, the committee here as to where we go forward. And so the question is, are, are we going to tinker with this or do we refer it directly to to council? I am I'm prepared, to, you know, I'd be happy for this to go to council as it is, because it is strengthening policy that protects people immediately. And even though it's policy that's you know discretionary, uh, uh, I, I I think it gets gets the work, the intention done of strengthening it a little bit. Yes, it's not ideal, but I, I don't think it's going to be ideal at the end of the day. Um, so uh, I, I think we're ready to go. But if some, maybe other councillors think there's some other little tinkering that we can okay. do. Any comment from council before we uh, move this forward? Councillor Stigner? I'd, I'd personally like to see this come to council as it's currently written. Do you want to make that motion? I'll second the motion. Okay, so Councilor Stapen is making that motion. Councilor Palmer is seconding that motion. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of it going to council? Opposed? Note that Councilor Lucia, Councilor Cherry, Councilor Orlando are opposed. Motion passes. Balance of council are in favor. All right, we are done that. Thank you. Moving on to, uh, I would like someone to make a motion for me to go in camera pursuant to 90.1 A and K of the community charter. Councilor Stapeners, Councilor Devon, all in favor? Motion's carried. We'll take a five minute break.